Hi, everybody. On this episode of the Gentle Parenting Show, we are here with Katie Holleran. She is a special education teacher. She's also a board certified behavioral analyst. She's also a certified gentle sleep coach and a mom. She helped me, or together we co-authored um, our workbook, the Good Night Sleep Tight Workbook for children with special needs, uh, toddlers to um, to teens or tweens, I guess we should say. So welcome and thank you so much for joining us here today, Katie. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Kim. Yeah. So there's so much to talk about about this topic. Let's first sort of set the stage in that um, how prevalent is it? We, we know that in neurotypical children, uh, behavioral sleep problems are 20 to 30% of the population. So what about children with special needs? And maybe we could have a, a moment to define what we mean by special needs also. Sure, sure. Um, I We know that there is a much higher prevalence um, of sleep disturbances, broadly mm -hmm. defined, um, as Tr trouble falling asleep, trouble staying asleep, trouble in the early morning hours. Um, those are much higher, higher um, reported <laughs> in parents of kids with special needs. So when we're looking at, you know, the latest research, um, there's was this really a, a much larger study than had been done before that was done in 2019. Mm -hmm. And that was supposed, um, w was focused on kids with autism and developmental delays versus general population. So yeah. it isn't always that particular um, group of diagnoses, but this, I thought this research was super helpful and it's very recent. So I think it really gives us a picture and it was also a really large group. So it was over 700 kiddos in each, um, category. So seven, more than 700 kiddos with autism and developmental delays, more than 700 kiddos that are, that had typical development and they were ages two to five. Um, mm -hmm. and this was published in pediatrics, the journal, and they found that it was more than twice as common for the kids who had autism and developmental delays than the neurotypical group. So that's one kind of data point that I think is really important. When we look kind of over the research broadly, there, in terms of looking at diagnoses, we might see cerebral palsy, we might see Down syndrome, we might see that autism developmental delays. And there are smaller bits of research along the way that have, be, uh, have been done in the past 15, 20 years. And we're seeing that it can be up to 80% of that particular group of parents who are reporting behavioral problems with sleep. So yeah. it's at, you know, we're, we're looking at a much higher rate, regardless of what study yeah. we use. It's there, you know, it's, it's a yeah. much higher rate. So then if I'm a parent of one of these kids, does that mean I'm like, you know, doomed that sleep will always be bad and there is no way to improve it? Yeah, it's a really good question. And one that I hear a lot and see a lot is, you know, just kind of that myth of thinking um, that because there is this diagnosis or my child has this particular need, then I will always experience, my child will always experience some sort of sleep disturbance. So I think that that is a myth that we can really work on and really talk to families about. Um, because what we can see is that with behavioral support, for the most part. And sometimes, and we can talk about this more, sometimes we really need to make sure we're looking at the medical side of things, obviously, as well. But looking at that behavior, those behavioral supports um, in the research and in practice that you and I know and that the general sleep community knows as well, we can make behavioral gains for our kids with special needs as well. So I think that that is a myth in terms of first, you know, we do want to make sure that families are looking at medical concerns around sleep disturbances to see what's going on there. And then we can also look at those behavioral supports that we can put in place to really increase um, the positive sleep behaviors. And I think that's 
really important in terms of how we talk about sleep is that we talk about it as a behavior and as a skill and something that can be learned. So, you know, many kids with particular diagnoses are in particular therapies that are learning various skills. And this is another skill that can be taught and can be learned. And so it doesn't have to mean that because we have this diagnosis in our family, we will never sleep again. Thank goodness. Yes, it is good news. <laughs> yes. And so I know that one of the things we talked about in the workbook is that if your child has a team that's working with him or her, mm -hmm. then um, what would you suggest that the parent talk to the team about? Yep. I think actually, first and foremost, it's just talking to the team about sleep, right? I think that we overlook it sometimes. We think maybe you know, my occupational therapist isn't really that worried about how my kiddo sleeps or that's not what we're focused on in, in right. occupational therapy, or there's so much that I want to talk to my pediatrician about, you know, sleep just really isn't kind of on the docket of things we need to talk about. Um, even speech therapist, any, any kind of specialist that's working with your child, I think it's important to just talk about it and to say, these are the concerns I have sleep included. And I think that what you'll see is that there are really great ways that teams can come together around the issue of sleep. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we can look at the sensory pieces. We can look at kind of teaching some skills that will help children be able to communicate throughout a process of learning that that ability to go to sleep on their own. And then pediatricians being able to monitor and understand kind of what's developmentally appropriate. You know, it makes sense that your young kiddo with autism is kind of testing boundaries at bedtime. That's actually super developmentally appropriate. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we can look at kind of where those red flags are in terms of, you know what, this is definitely something that needs to be worked on. And this is something that you can kind of put on the back burner in terms of sleep, you know, and so you can really kind of make those decisions with the broader team mm -hmm. um, if, if, that's, if that's something that you have for your kiddo. Mm -hmm. So then uh, if a parent who's listening that has a child, let's say, with autism um, or a developmental delay and they are struggling with sleep, what do you think? And let's say they've talked with their team and some, some you know, teams probably are more aware of resources around sleep than others. Yeah. So what, what if they feel like they kind of hit a wall or they're not sure where to start or what to do, or, you know, should, you know, lots of times we hear, oh, I was just told to like lock my kid in the room and shut the door. And that's the only way we're going to get them to go to sleep. Do you have any other kind of tips and tricks? <laughs> I do. I have other ones other than locking yeah. the door. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think that and and kind of going back to some of the strategies that we talk about in our workbook, um, I think that some of the biggest um, strategies and tools that I talk to parents about are on the front end, on the proactive end. So what can we do to kind of set up an environment in a way that is supportive of going to sleep? So I think that mm -hmm. is often where I'll start with families. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes we can see if we put pieces in place kind of towards the end of the day as a bedtime routine um, and then at, at, in that going to sleep at bedtime time frame, we can really see some positive momentum and we can get some motivation to work on some of the problems that might occur overnight or in the early morning hours. So I think, you know, schedule is really something that we first and foremost need to focus on and really making sure that we have a supportive schedule in place. And we do outline some of the kind of generally ideal schedules of, um, of kiddos uh, in, our, in our workbook based on they mostly based on they're based on chronological age, but we talk about how to kind of map developmentally appropriate um, uh, stages as well. So because mm -hmm. with kids with special needs, it isn't always kind of that direct correlation with chronology. So if your child is chronologically four years old, they may need additional naps or additional daytime sleep than um, a than a neurotypical kiddo might need. So those are some mm -hmm. things, some considerations, but really. Mm -hmm. 
I think that comes down to watching our kids and understanding what they need. And then really having that kind of overnight hours be very supportive. So I think for the most part, we're looking at that bedtime seven to 8:30 ish at night, mm-hmm. you know, for the most part for our toddlers to tween set that wouldn't change that wouldn't shift too much in those windows. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, how do we kind of backwards chain our day to make sure that we are in that bedtime routine, you know, by that kind of seven o'clock, seven thirty time, so that we're really falling to sleep within that seven to eight thirty range at night. And I think that sometimes is actually just the the biggest thing that we start with. And that can be really hard, right? There's a lot of things that um, we kind of have to reorganize our lives um, in in terms of really figuring out that schedule. But I do think that's often, first and foremost, what I work with with families. And then putting some supports in place around bedtime. Um, I am a huge fan of visuals, and I've seen how effective they can be for our kids. Um, And so we have a few in the workbook, but really setting up some um, visual supports that can help to outline bedtime and um, what is expected of the kiddo, what what bedtime's going to look like, how we're going to go through this bedtime process together, and what what that looks like when it's time to fall asleep. Um, I think that those two kind of proactive supports can really help to, to set the stage for a good night. Like after we brush our teeth, we go, we put on our pajamas, we pick out a book or whatever the list is. Exactly. Yep. And I love to set it up with pictures. Mm -hmm. So you, you have each step and, and super small steps. So we wouldn't want to put you know, bath, brush, teeth, jammies all on one line. That's three separate things, right? So bath, then the next line would be brush teeth. Then the next line would be put jammies on or vice Mm -hmm. versa. However, you organize your evening. It doesn't really matter kind of how the the order that you do things. It's just being consistent with how you do it and that this is our bedtime routine. And then having those visuals of your kiddo doing those things can be really effective too, because it's not just some other kiddo or a cartoon kiddo doing this, it's, oh, that's me brushing my teeth. That's me putting my jammies on and they can mm-hmm. check it off or you can check it off. Um, so that's one way of doing, of doing that routine, making it a checklist. And I find that that really helps parents stay organized too. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know as a parent, it's helpful to say, okay, we're doing all of these things and here's the order. And it kind of takes my you know, my mental capacity, there's, there's very little mental capacity at the end of the day. So it's just there for you, for both of you to be able to follow. Um, You can also do that in a more narrative format. So you could have that look more like what we call a social story or a narrative. And so you would have that each step of the routine. So let's say it's brushing teeth. That would be one page of a story in your kid's bedtime story. Mm -hmm. And then then they flip, they turn the page and the next page Mm -hmm. is putting jammies on. And so each each page is, and it's a narrative format starring your child. And so that's exciting. And if there are siblings or other children, you can incorporate pictures of them too. So then I say good night to everybody and maybe you have a picture of everybody. Um, and then you can, you know, really incorporate that and make it really specific. And even the the narrative is nice because you can add what happens when it's time to fall asleep to that. So I'm mm-hmm. um, mom or dad or caregiver is going to turn off the lights. They're going to give me a hug. They're going to sing one song and you can be super specific about what that is. You know, if it's one song, let's keep it at one song because that's what the book says. And then I can, I can cuddle with my friends. Maybe they have a particular lovey or couple of loveys in their, in their beds with them. If I, if I can't fall asleep, I can roll over onto my back. If you know, I've had a kiddo before who really was comfortable on his back, but would kind of forget that he was comfortable on his back. But that was kind of what, so they would often have to, his parents would often have to kind of support him in doing that. So you could include that in a story. If I am having trouble falling asleep, I'll roll onto my back, cuddle my friends, you know, and different things that kids can do instead of just saying, the end. Now it's time to go to sleep. You know, again, we're trying to teach that skill and really helping them know here are the actual behaviors I can do that can help me calm down. Mm -hmm. 
And so do, is there, and then, well, what's going to happen after that? How about, <laughs> right? Because I can hear the family say, okay, that's fine. Yeah, Go lovely. Me. But then what am I going to do? I'm going to leave the room and then he's going to cry and follow out after me or perseverate and go over and over about, you know, lining things up or I'm not ready or whatever it is. Totally. Absolutely. All of those things. Yeah. Um, yeah. It sounds great to, you know, have this lovely bedtime routine and then, and then yeah, what? Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, what I found hugely supportive for our kids is, um, to use a gradual approach. So we will often use the shuffle in terms of how we organize this, this actual going to sleep with our kiddos. So we will, depending on whether your kid's in a crib or in a bed, wh whatever that looks like, if they're in their own room or if you're room sharing, all of that actually doesn't matter. That's up to you and your family what makes the most sense for you. But I think the key is how you teach them to actually fall asleep on their own. And much like you're teaching any other skill or much like you see the therapist that your child works with or the teachers that your child work with, they don't just introduce a new skill mm -hmm. and then back away and say, hope you can Hope you can figure that out, right? Whether it's an academic skill, you know, learning letters or something functional in life like tying shoes or picking up a mm -hmm. utensil to use to eat food. You're not just kind of throwing a spoon at a kiddo and then hoping that they can figure out what to do with it. You want to make sure that you're teaching it incrementally. So it's the same with sleep. So we would actually probably stay right by the kiddo, depending on what the history has been. So if there's a history of co-sleeping. So you, you know, your child is used to falling asleep right next to you, for instance. We would start that, that kind of first step, first position. It's like kind of a 1A. There's a couple of first steps, actually. We would kind mm -hmm. of have some really small. So maybe you are sitting next to your child instead of laying down, right? Any right. small movement counts as movement towards teaching the skill. It doesn't have to be some big grandiose or like you said, you know, just close the door and see what happens. You know, you really want to start super small and then you can build from there. So you could sit on the bed right next to them instead of laying down. You could sit on the end on the edge of the bed instead of laying down and then you could start maybe sitting next to the bed. Sometimes I'll have families who will actually go from co-sleeping to sitting next to the bed only because it's a different visual for a kiddo. Mm -hmm. And you have to think as a parent, what's feasible for you? If you're sitting on the bed, is it going to be pretty easy because it's late in the day and you're exhausted? Is it going to be pretty easy for you to actually just snuggle in and lay down? Mm -hmm. And then you kind of haven't made that first step. Yeah. You know, you have to kind of think of what's most feasible for right. you on your end um, because your behavior as a parent is what matters here, right? So right. we're going to model what it's going to look like and what it's going to feel like for the kiddo. But any, but but the the basic idea is that we're starting somewhere and we're making a small step, and then we can always grow those steps. And right. the the general idea here is that you're finding a balance with supporting your child, mm -hmm. and that can look. Um, I talk about it as the most effective but least intrusive way of supporting your child to learn this skill. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, it's probably going to be, quote, intrusive in terms of I'm sitting right here with you. Uh, maybe I'm rubbing your leg. I'm rubbing your back. Whatever might feel good for the kiddo. And then every three-ish nights, you're moving incrementally away. And again, that can look like I'm just rubbing his back less. I'm rubbing and then I'm taking a five second pause and then rubbing mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different ways to incorporate that move away or that fading of yourself as part of the process. It doesn't have to be so um, intense as like you said, just kind of closing the door and hoping mm -hmm. it all goes okay. So is it fair to say that you often um, recommend kind of stretching out the shuffle? Because like, so I would say to, for a, you know, neurotypical child, usually, you know, we move in three night increments, seven to 10 nights, largely sleeping through the night, naps two to three weeks. Is it fair to say that it might take a little bit longer, but of course doable? Um, absolutely. But is that a fair 
thing to say. It is. Yes, that is fair. I think that I, I will often, of course, there's no crystal ball with families. And if, if it makes sense to move every three nights, great, go for it, you know, like just, just go with that process. But, um, I will say we, we often spend four, five, maybe six nights in a position. Now, what's important there is, again, finding that balance because you can easily get stuck. So it's great to move from laying down with a kid, a kiddo needing to lay down with you to fall asleep to um, rubbing their back a little bit and sitting next to them. But if that's where it ends, it might be harder for It might not have solved, like, that's great that you've moved that way. But then if they still need that forever, that's not necessarily kind of getting that independent skill mastered. So, you know, you really need to find that balance of moving and moving is a big part of it. It just doesn't have to be as fast as three nights if that doesn't feel um, like it was enough practice. So you're really thinking of this in positions that they can practice falling asleep. And it also doesn't mean that they're perfect at it before you move. So we are responsive to our kiddos, but they're they're not necessarily going to be just falling asleep all on their own without needing you before you move. It's okay to move before it feels like they're quite ready. It's okay. You're not going so far. You know, the second position, if you're sitting next to the bed, you're just moving a few inches away. You're moving kind of into the middle of the room, depending on how big the kiddo's room is. And sometimes we'll have a couple of moves within the room. So even if it's three nights, you could move a little bit you know, even just six inches and then another six inches and then another six inches. So even the movement is, is helpful and you're not going so far that again, you're kind of, you know, pulling the rug from underneath your kiddo. You're, you're really going in increments um, purposefully so that you can have that balance. So yes, I've definitely kind of will take a slower approach, but that comes with the caveat of that doesn't mean we never move. (laughs) Right. Right. Otherwise you just are creating a new sleep problem. It's a whole, yes. Yeah. That you have to undo, um, which makes it harder. So I was thinking about, um, you know, some of the strategies and, and tips and even products, uh, that we recommend in the workbook that are, that are sometimes needed more, um, with these kiddos, um, uh, so let's talk about some of those, you know, I'm even thinking about how some kids some are and some aren't helped by weighted blankets. Mm-hmm. Um, as an example, um, uh, I often will ask a family, uh, can they go back to their team and ask the OT if they're getting any OT work for sensory processing? Are there exercises for, for sleep, like, you know, joint compression or I don't know what, tell me about, let's tell the audience, like what else that, that could be different and helpful that they're not seeing in, you know, a a regular sleep training book or sleep coaching book. Right. I think that, um, a couple of things, one talking to the team is, is is invaluable because they're going to have, you know, the latest and greatest supports and they also know your kiddo. So they're going to know what's going to make sense. So weighted blankets I've seen be super successful, super helpful for our, for kiddos. Um, some and some right. not at all. Right. So you're, you're, um, some of this is a little bit because these supports are, are supports there. It's not kind of a magic wand that's, you know, then we try to wait a blanket and slept through the night forever. Right. It's not usually at least that, yeah kind of simple. Mm -hmm. So it is a support. It is a help. And so it's helpful to know kind of, would my kiddo respond to some of that extra pressure? Mm -hmm. Um, And then also making sure with an OT or an expert of how heavy that weighted blanket should be based on your kid's um, weight and size. You want to make sure that it's a balance and that we're not um, having too much weight or too little weight. So, you know, we don't want it to be too light. We want it to actually serve its purpose of providing that kind of compression that's helpful. So um, if that is a helpful support, I think those are fantastic. And again, I think going to your team is really helpful. I also really, um, with kiddos in cribs, sometimes we'll see um, behaviors like headbanging um, or things that might feel really 
scary for parents, uh, rightly so. You know, we certainly don't want our kids to be hurting. Mm-hmm. Now, in the beginning of the of the shuffle, when you're right there, you can usually, you know, calmly help a child kind of get back down to a sleep. You know, you can pat the mattress or use your voice or rubbing back to kind of get them to um, lay down again, or at least be sitting down or, or calmly down, not banging their head. But also, I think another support is using those crib liners. And I think we have kind of a, a few options in the in the at least one option in the in the workbook of those vertical crib liners those have been hugely helpful too because it just takes that extra stress away from you you know maybe he's doing that behavior and you know sometimes with our kiddos that actually is a sensory you know they might need that kind of feedback we just want them to have it have that feedback in a safe way and one that's not going to hurt them so that's another support that i found it to be hugely helpful along with weighted blankets um Another support that I love because it's visual is uh, a clock. So there's a number of uh, options that we talk about in the um, in the workbook, but um, I think this can be helpful at bedtime, overnight, and in the morning. So it's one of those mm-hmm. things that I think helps for all the things. Mm-hmm. And re- there's a, a number of different visual options that you can choose. So um, with a quick search of a visual clock, you know, there's, and there's fancy ones now, like the hatch that has, you know, that's, you know, you can have an app on your phone and all the things are connected. Um, But the basic, the basic idea is that there's some sort of visual that shows a child it's time to sleep and it's time, it's okay to be awake. So whatever that looks like, sometimes it's a moon when it's nighttime and a sun when it's daytime. Sometimes it's right. yellow when it's nighttime, green when it's daytime, whatever that looks like um, doesn't really matter. It's actually just using that vis- visual. And I think the key with that support is actually using it in a way that's teaching that's actually instructive. So Mm -hmm. that actually falls on parents. So we have to be the ones who teach that skill because if you just kind of throw a clock in there and say, well, I mean, it turns colors, but we get up at whatever time and we, you know, go to bed at whatever time that didn't seem to work. It's, it's not going to be again, this magic kind of chain game changer unless you actually teach it. So if it's nighttime, that means kiddos in bed, we're wherever we are in the shuffle, that's where we are. And then if it's not morning time yet, you know, if it's five and it's not time to wake up, we actually have to model that for our children and say, Oh, it's not time to wake up. I'll see you when it is. And then go through the shuffle or wherever we are in that process to support our kids to know it's not time to wake up yet. So we actually have to teach it and model it. And sometimes kids won't even notice it. You know, I, I will talk with families who a couple of nights in, they're like, I don't, I don't think it's working. He hasn't really noticed it. And as long as you're talking about it as a parent and saying, Oh, look, the light's green. It's time to wake up. They're going to start to see that connection, but it's with your behavior. And that's the only way that it's really going to, going to be learned. Yeah. I think we have, as parents, we have to be like a broken record about yes. the clock. You know, every single time they wake up, oh, look, your clock's not whatever. Yep. You know, it's not a sun, isn't green. That means we have to lie quietly in our bed and go back to sleep and snuggle with our friends. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And that's where, again, the like the story, the sleep story can, you know, I will stay in bed, you know, we can stop talk about it there. I stay in bed until my light turns green or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, you know, speaking of being a broken record that I've seen that even with the checklist and the stories too, you know, my kid doesn't really seem to care about the checklist on the wall. Doesn't matter. Just keep being that broken record and keep talking about it. You keep Keep using it and they'll start using it too. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other, you know, resources that you like to share with parents? I know you have some even websites you really like or other types of resources. Yeah, I think that um, there's a a curriculum called the Zones of Regulation that I love to share with families. Um, Leah Kuypers is an occupational therapy uh, therapist who created it. And she started working with it um, with kids in schools and then did a lot of great research around it and created this this 
this program. And I think it just has so many great benefits for us at home and as part of sleep too. And my favorite parts of it are actually some of the breathing techniques. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think, but I think the book in general and the website in general is just super helpful. And basically it kind of, it really guides kids through a clear way of understanding their own self-regulation. So understanding where they are and it's a scale. So you're looking at a color, a color code, kind of scale of where you are. So if you're super, you know, amped up, you know, you're, you're really just kind of, you know, ants in your pants, you know, having trouble kind of um, getting organized and getting regulated. You know, we call that, that we're a little bit in the yellow zone. You're super angry or upset. You're in that red zone and we need to kind of stop and calm down. You're super tired. You're in the blue zone. And then the ultimate great zone for at least for learning and for being able to, um, kind of access anything that's in our world, in our environment, that's going to be the green zone. And there's no right or wrong. We all, I think some of the teaching of the of the zones is great because you can, it's not bad to be in the red zone. We've all been in the red zone, super angry at something. It's how we use our coping skills and what kind of tools we can use to get back to that ideal, more ideal zone. And when it's time for bed, it's great to be in the blue zone. We want to be in the blue zone before bed, right? So it's, it, there's benefits to each of the zones, but I love talking about it in these kind of specific color coded ways. And I think kids really resonate with that. And along with that are these breathing techniques. So using um, uh, some visuals again, uh, and some, and some really, um, also using your body. So sometimes we'll do kind of figure eight breathing and you breathe in on one side of the eight and you breathe out on the other side of the eight. Um, and that really helps kids kind of get a tactile. Sometimes I'll see kiddos try it on their bellies or on their legs, especially as you're trying to fall asleep and really getting that kind of tactile input as well. And then, and then kind of getting that breathing because it's hard to just say like, take deep breaths and calm down if I don't really know what that means. So really giving them a specific thing to do while their bodies are trying to relax. And again, as with any kind of tool or strategy, it's not going to necessarily take off right away. But if you continue to practice it and to model it as mom, dad, caregiver, um, then you start to see kiddos really do. And so I've, I've had parents that'll, you know, text me or write in their sleep log and say, oh my gosh, I see, I see them on the monitor and they're doing the figure eight in the air as they're trying to get relaxed. And, you know, that's just super cool for me to hear. <laughs> Absolutely. It's always great to see to watch our children learn new skills, whether it's going to sleep or figuring out how to bring themselves down when they're upset or feeling impatient about something. Absolutely. Totally. So, you know, tell us why working on sleep with kids with special needs can be so effective and what other than, oh, the parents are so relieved, they're finally getting some rest. Absolutely. I think you're right. I think, you know, overall, we know that um, cognitive ability, behavior, um, everything gets better when kids are, are better rested. So all of the research points to, to that. Um, so we know that. But then I think kind of more tangibly for, for families, I, I've been thinking and, and reflecting on a lot of my families who are reporting that, you know, therapies that they're in or school that they're in is that much more effective when their kids are rested. So we see that kids are open to learning. They're open to learning new skills because their bodies are rested. And on even even kind of more on a, on a small, even more important, but smaller scale is even that therapies can happen. So I started as a home-based therapist. After teaching in the classroom, I worked as a home-based therapist. And there were countless times that I would go into a, a family's home ready for my session and the kiddo would be asleep and just fell asleep. And mom is, you know, really having a hard time waking, waking kiddo up or is exhausted and mm. clearly just, you know, I don't know. I don't even know where to start as a therapist because this kiddo is so tired. So mm -hmm. sessions would be shorter or missed or just not effective. So I think that you can actually harness all of the work that is being done better when your kiddos are actually well rested. Um, so I think that's a big piece is that actually therapy can and school can happen and can be that much more effective. Um, and, you know, I, 
to, like you said, a well-rested family is absolutely a, ha a happier and less stressed family. Mm -hmm. I think if you think about how, you know, small things that might be a small thing on one day, if it's a day that you're tired becomes just that much bigger oh, okay. um, and that much more amplified. If you think about that from your kiddo's perspective, it's the same. And so, you know, trying to learn something that might be frustrating, mm -hmm. it's just that much harder to actually kind of work through that frustration or trying to communicate with someone when that is a challenge for you becomes that much more amplified if you're also exhausted on top of it. So I think there's some kind of broad range, but also even just being available for learning is just, I think what, what I see kind of the biggest transformation, but also, um, you know, just that emotional kind of toll that being exhausted and being stressed about being exhausted. Right. So it's like yeah. this thing that kind of hangs over our head and I know my kid's tired. And so that just becomes this, um, weight on you, um, as a, as a parent and a caregiver too. Mm -hmm. That's so awesome. So, Katie, there's so many things we could talk about, right? In terms of breaking down and improving sleep. And we will put links um, to many of the resources we discussed today on the episode page. But is there any kind of takeaway you'd like to leave parents with, you know, uh, um, who are listening to this, who are struggling with their child's sleep, who has special needs? Um, I think, you know, one thing that I learned from you, Kim, actually, is just this phrase that has always stuck with me and I, I repeat it a lot, is that mm -hmm. it's only a problem if it's a problem. So I think it's really easy to get caught up in thinking, um, whatever it might be, you know, my, my kiddo sleeps in my bed or my kiddo sleeps in another bed in my room or my kid's still in a crib or whatever it is feels like it's not the right call. But if your kiddo is sleeping, it's likely not not a problem. Again, if you're if you're seeing that your kiddo is rested, if you're rested, then I think that that's okay to say that yes, maybe it's not like the most, you know, kind of cookie cutter ideal way that that we might be sleeping, but if it's if you're rested and your kids are rested, then that's it's not a problem. Now, if it becomes a problem, so yes, at one point we were able to sleep all in the same bed and it was lovely. And now that is not happening. One of us isn't sleeping. None of us are sleeping. Then, okay, something that we need to address. So I think that's mm -hmm. kind of the key. And I think too, when we think of that on the scale of having a child with special needs, um, as we kind of alluded to earlier, you know, there are so many priorities and so many therapists and so many doctors that so many families are seeing. If it's just not, if it, if the bandwidth is not there, then it's not there and just get the rest that you can get and figure it, we'll figure it out later. Everything's figure outable later. You're not kind of setting life up for, you know, disaster forever. You, you know, you need to kind of compartmentalize your life into seasons. If this is not the season to work on sleep, okay. And especially during the pandemic, um, yeah. as we're the time we're recording this, we are in a pandemic. Um, I have told families now, you know, again, what's your bandwidth? And I've, you know, worked with a lot of families who have said, I think we're ready. And then when we get into it, there's just so many stressors on life right now that the bandwidth isn't there. So we pause and that's okay. You're not setting again, you're not kind of setting into motion some downward spiral for the rest of life. You will get to a point when you have the bandwidth to work on it again. So I think that you know, it's only a problem if it's a problem is super important. The way that we work on sleep, the way that sleep looks in your family can look very different than your neighbor, your family member, your sister, anyone. Mm -hmm. um, and that's okay if you're rested and if your kids are rested. And if not, then let's figure out what we can work on and we can prioritize that. So maybe we just want to work on bedtime and we're going to kind of figure out the rest later. Okay. Right. You, you, that's fine. If you can get some momentum there, you might find, oh, now I feel like I have more bandwidth and I'm ready to work on some other pieces and I'm ready to keep going. So I think kind of giving yourself that grace and that moment to say, okay, I, I have the bandwidth for something. I might not have the bandwidth for everything, but what can I start with to get some momentum I think is really helpful. Awesome. I love that. It's giving hope and being kind and gentle to yourself and your family and making your priorities. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is like, you know, 
parenting forever. <laughs> like, yeah. where, what do I have the bandwidth for, right? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, thank you so much for sharing all your tips and wisdom. And if you want to learn more about Katie Holleran, we're going to put all the links on sleeplady.com forward slash podcast. You'll see, you can follow her on Instagram and Facebook and her website and learn more about our workbook and uh, links to some of the resources we talked about. So thank you again. Thank you, Kim. It was great to be here. Bye-bye.